as you'll remember, this fifth day of From Risk to Resilience in, in our core structure, we're using these last two days to, to try and look in more detail at um, climate resilience and 30 options for climate resilience. And we obviously haven't touched all the options because one of the options is nutritional diversity that was just raised in our group. Um, but we're, we're looking at 30 options. And today we're going to start by finishing um, the, the set of options with physical and technological options. Um, and then we're going to take a step back and think about how might we finance some of this. Uh, Kwame was just um, explaining to us some really interesting work uh, that they're doing with uh, training of trainers in agroecology, using natural plants as pests, barriers to pests, doing biocomposting, but the difficulty of raising funds to actually run these sort of events and trainings. So we'll have a quick think about access to finance. And finally, how do we document and spread understanding of our work on climate resilience in ways that might open up connections to climate finance? Um, so that's the, the structure of the day. And then your homework uh, is, is over the whole year. <laughs> you'll be asked to uh, set up a business incubation unit that helps local business manage risk, including climate risks. That'll be your homework for the day um, uh, because we don't have another session to report back uh, tomorrow. So this last module um, is going to cover physical and technological options for climate resilience. And um, another interesting observation this morning, I think from Nixon was that many of these options are related to one another. If you want to work on your social organization um, and, and do business incubation, uh, you might then need uh, finance to support your, your, um, your business ideas and you might need to strengthen your natural resources, your ecology to, to say produce honey, and that might need a policy change from the government, which means you need to have stronger representation. So I think that's a very valuable observation that resilience is, is interconnected, it's integrated. And we need, we, we mentioned that in the opening module on climate resilience. It's, it's about building capability in all of these 30 areas over time. So what are the physical and technological options? And some of these are very simple and some of them are a little bit more advanced. So you'll see that we've covered the first uh, 22 options up yesterday and we're just dealing with this brown orange box at the bottom left on physical and technological options. Um, and I'll throw out a few ideas for each of these uh, areas. Um, just as an example, we have colleagues here from, from Zambia, and um, one of the success stories in recent years has been the Choma District Tree Nursery Association, um, which started with a small number of um, women and, and some men too, in the land of the forest department field station, uh, selling tree seedlings. And it's now blossomed into a, a huge uh, business with many members and, and selling very large numbers of seedlings to, to different um, regional projects. Uh, but it almost uh, came unstuck early on because of drought and the fact that the seedlings were dying for lack of water. So one of the uh, necessary things to cope with that climate threat was to um, find the funding for, a, for drilling a borehole. Um, and so the, the producer association worked with NGO partners and the forestry department to find the finance to, to drill a, a borehole. And that's allowed this um, 
uh, great expansion in the Nursery Association uh, and its resilience of all its members, the people who work in it. So physical and technological options for climate resilience are part of the, uh, part of the picture. And um, there are a number of options and things that, that are sort of in the physical or technological area. Um, we mentioned uh, when we talked about social options and representing um, a, a farmer producer organization with government, that often there are tenure and land issues. Um, you have to work with local authorities and chiefs. You have to work with government authorities to try and secure the land and resources. And one of the physical or technological options you can use is, is developing maps and land use plans that can help you to, to get agreement with the authorities and secure your resources. Another technological or physical thing is, is using either inventory, physical inventory or geospatial remote sensing to monitor your forest stock or your, your area and the condition of that, either to plan for the, for the, 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 the market, knowing how much timber you have, or perhaps proving to a a government department or a donor that you're managing a forest area sustainably. Um, and so again, these sorts of tools can help you with your resilience in terms of tenure and your relationships with government, but also your, your ability to do business with the market. Physical boundaries are another thing that we can do physically, fences, fire breaks, wind breaks, to protect your forest and farm. Terracing, we, we mentioned soil erosion control yesterday, and this is closely linked to that, but terracing can, can avoid um, uh, soil loss of soil fertility over time, and that's particularly important as climates become drier and more variable. Um, we can think of electrification and technology, trying to replace some of what is done in a business by hand with a machine that saves time and money and perhaps sharing the costs between the members to, to purchase those. And we can think of storage and transport. Um, one of the options that Kwame just showed was a, a store for grain that the, uh, FFPO and, and project put in, and that allowed farmers to, to store their crops until the harvest season was over and the price rose again. So in, in any commodity, you have a price <coughs> cycle. And, uh, and when the harvest season, when everybody is trying to sell a product, the price is usually low. And then when, when there's uh, nobody trying to sell it, then the price is high. So a store can greatly in increase your profits and your resilience over time. Water management, that's obviously a key area, rainwater catchment, um, uh, boreholes, irrigation, reusing water, all of these things are important for climate resilience. And finally, information services, using mobile phone technology, to share data on, on weather, weather trends, market, market information, buyers, and so on. So those are some of the physical and technological options for climate resilience that I'll just go through in a bit more detail now. Um, maps and plans, we, we can create maps and land use plans that secure our tenure and avoid conflict. Um, these days, it's often possible to use simple geographical information systems to create maps, um, and, and they can be really useful both for men and women in designating areas um, that can be used by women. I know in, in Zambia, there's been work with some of the chiefs um, to, to designate certain areas for use by women's producer groups. 
Um, and that's, that's really helpful. When, I, when we looked at the case studies we'd done, there wasn't a specific example of, of a map or a land use plan, but um, Kalari in Ecuador have developed a geographical labeling system for their traditional chakra agroforestry. And that says, if you buy this product, you are contributing to an indigenous agroforestry system that will protect the environment and the people. So they're using their geographical area to give them an advantage in the market. They're saying this product is special because it comes from this place on this, this area. So maps and, and plans can be used in different ways to help uh, build your resilience. Then there's the issue of, um, you know, doing a physical inventory to assess your stock. And several of the African countries, I think Kenya, um, I think Tanzania and Zambia, have all taken part in training of farmers on how to um, measure your stock uh, when you're growing trees so that you can get a better deal with buyers and you can plan sales as a group. Um, there are also ways of, of, of using satellite mapping um, to, to look at from the, from the air and, and see which areas are forest and which areas are not. And when you're trying to get climate finance, sometimes you have to prove to people that you're looking after a forest and using those satellite images can be helpful if you want to do that. So this is Titi Gao in Tanzania training its members in timber inventory to improve their stock information for its buyers. That increases orders and income and therefore that builds the resilience of, of the group and their ability to survive in the long term. Physical boundaries are, are, are often very important. Um, uh, whether it's livestock uh, and wild animals that you're trying to protect your crops and trees from, um, we have a real problem with deer here in Scotland um, uh, where they come in and they'll completely eat out a new plantation of trees unless you have a deer proof fence. Um, in other countries, it's fire that's a, a major threat. Uh, in some places, it's wind can do a lot of damage. So we can use physical and natural barriers uh, to protect ourselves from those events which are often increasing in the face of climate change. Um, and the uh, cooperative Fed Prasau in Bolivia, they worked with their members to create border alleys for fire prevention and then have a succession of annual and perennial crops culminating in mature cocoa groves under timber when there had been um, a fire event. So they re-established the agroforestry um, using a successional technique. So physical boundaries are, are an issue we can think about. Another physical thing we can do is to, to develop terracing, um, and that can uh, often uh, reduce erosion and increase uh, soil permeability and infiltration on the terraces. You'll see it particularly in, in areas where, like this, where there's, I think this is actually rice paddy when I look at the figure, um, but, uh, but, but terracing can, can often be used or contour hedging and so on. Um, and Manarivo in Madagascar have been working with peanuts producer groups to establish terraces on steep slopes to maintain soil fertility and help production, even with the less favorable climate conditions. Then there's the whole area of going technological, of installing processing technology or, or actual processing units. And you can see here the Vietnam Cinnamon and Star Anise Cooperative with their factory um, and storage and office complex um, that was developed by a, a, a cooperative together with a buyer and then some finance from the bank. 
And by installing electricity and machines, of course, you, you make your production more efficient, uh, better working environments and better product quality. And that can uh, build the reputation of your business uh, and, and so improve your resilience in the face of, of climate change and other changes. We already mentioned the issue of uh, storage and transport. These are physical things that we can invest in to improve our resilience, our capacity to survive. Um, we need to be able to store our products for longer periods of time so that we can sell into the market when the price is high. Um, we need to be able to move our products to different markets so that we're not dependent just on a local market, but we actually have options that will maintain our resilience um, in, in, in many markets. And, uh, and we've already mentioned the example in Ghana, but here is uh, uh, the No Viva um, Association in Togo, which developed a stock aggregation unit for cassava and then installed a, a processing facility for women to, to produce various types of cassava flour. Um, and, uh, and you can see their, their, um, their production unit there. So these things don't have to be um, you know, highly uh, technologically advanced. They can be just at, at actually suited to the money available and the conditions that you've got. And so um, uh, second last option is, on, is thinking through your water management, uh, catching, channeling, reusing water. Uh, we've already talked about the Choma District Nursery Association who secured funds to drill their borehole um, and to provide year round water for the nursery. But there are other ways in, in remote areas that you can increase um, water retention, water saving, water reuse, the way you design V-shaped catchments for tree planting and so on. Um, and you'll probably all be well aware of many of these options. Finally, uh, it, there's this option of improving your information services. So using mobile telephony and the internet. And we've seen many examples of that um, over the the past few days, um, you can install systems that share data. That data can come in from on climate predictions and weather predictions that might help farmers prepare. Um, but more often it's used for um, getting market information on prices or on selling your product, making your uh, people customers aware of your product. And by using digital information systems uh, cleverly, we can improve our capacity of our business to sell into different markets and to know when the right time is to sell. And all of that improves uh, resilience. Um, so Manorivo AB in Madagascar was a, a company linked to four producer organizations, which was trying to diversify away from just peanuts and peanut oil into aromatic oils and coffee and things like that. Um, and of course, they have a, a website um, that advertises their, their cosmetic line uh, and so on. So I think I, I've probably um, said enough uh, in this particular final section on physical and um, technological infrastructure. Um, they're quite simple things, aren't they? None of this is rocket science. And I think um, you'll see that actually becoming more climate resilient is there's not a silver bullet for it. It's using many different options to give your farmer and producer organization and your businesses a little bit more variety, a little bit more strength, a little bit more diversity so that you can survive when climate and other shocks uh, happen in the system. So please, let's have a, a, a few uh, moments to, to take stock and ask any questions that you might have.
Danke, Mark mentioned in the chat, which um, you've already touched upon when you talked about um, the importance of physical boundaries in um, certain situations. He touched on um, the importance of bushfire management in, in the Ghana in context, in particular in the sort of semi-arid northern savannah region. Yes. I mean, and this is this is um, it, it, it's a whole science in itself, fire management. Um, you know, uh, it's not often you can do uh, clever things like controlled burns um, uh, to, to clear areas so that fire can't leap into productive areas um, or you can have physical barriers and so on. Um, but but uh, but yeah, it's worth mentioning that if you do want support for fire management, there are whole services, forest services in the US and other places where people can give you advice on, on good fire management techniques. I'm sure there's in the Savannah zone of Ghana, you've got experts um, who can deal with the, these issues. Um, okay, Anani, you would like to say something about the climate data and information in Togo with GIZ, please do go ahead. Uh, what I would like to, to, to share with you uh, on climate uh, information and data uh, provision to the, the farmers or farmers organizations is an experience that uh, I would like to share with you uh, from the GIZ, uh, especially the Green Innovation Center. They have uh, set up uh, since uh, 2018, uh, and they call it uh, a agribusiness uh, market and climate information system. Is uh, how do they do uh, to make uh, their farmers their, that they are they are competing in 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 terms of uh, climate and uh, um, so to say economy uh, resilience they try to uh, provide information to the farmers uh, in our context in togo uh, they, they provide information to, to to farmers via a short message a sms on the telephone the mobile telephone, and uh, it is the they, they, they made uh, the contract with the meteorological services and uh, um, also the national uh, uh, information and statistics, agricultural statistics uh, uh, services. They make contract with them, and they have a program that sends directly SMS. To the farmers and farmers uh, group leaders uh, on uh, climate information uh, according to the the region uh, where or agro uh, agroecological zone where they are, and also provide them the market information on how price are going on on the market on different markets, a uh, local, regional, and national level. That's what I would like to share. And this is a kind of uh, maybe a system that may a FFF can, uh, can maybe, I don't know, set up by the, or think, think about by, 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 by the next years. Uh, this is, uh, but uh, to say is some of our FFF POs uh, who have been, also involved in the GIZ, the GIC uh, projects uh, are also being pro 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 provided this kind of information. And I can say it's a kind of uh, synergy that is created uh, between FFF and, and GIC, Green Innovation Center of GIZ. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Anani. And that's a really useful example of using information technology and just a simple SMS service, but it's combining 
both weather information and information on market prices is that that sounds really useful to farmers and and so we could you know that's the sort of thing that an apex level forest and farm producer organization could explore in any country um donald you've got your hand up and i can see there's some comments coming as well in the chat yeah thank you thank you so much again duncan uh, i just want to share something uh, you 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 speak about the issue of technology and maybe i will just try to uh, give us an example and to see how we can work with this because i know uh, that sometimes we have this uh, authority which is actually responsible to giving out the information concerning the weather but now for instance to our case here in tanzania you find that uh, they are giving the information is too general like uh, for instance maybe in manyara they can just give you the information uh, concerning the climate key information on a particular region but they don't go uh, on a specific maybe uh, district or village where is basically we are working so we find that maybe sometimes you might get the information concerning the weather or concerning the climate but it may not be really realistic or it may not be really uh, fit in the community which we are working with and now I don't know how are we going to, to deal with that but I think that is something that maybe we, we should also think uh, or try to explore how we can uh, deal with uh, with such issues because now we need to get the information if we are providing the information to the farmer direct at the ground for instance because we're working with the farmer group you find that the farmer who is in a remote area you cannot just rely on the on the information which may be the government or the meteorological agent has given based on the particular region but when you go deeply to the ground where you really find farmers you find is something which actually might not be really realistic or might not be true so I don't know how are we going to do really this, but I just think that maybe this is something I need to post so that maybe we can discuss and see it for further how we can explore more on these options. Thank you. Thank you very much, Donald. Yes, I, I guess there are real challenges, aren't there, in getting information um, that is that is accurate and useful at the at the specificity that you need to, to help with agricultural activities. Um, so we'd be interested if if people can share in the chat other other ways they've found of doing that. Um, we seem to be picking up a, um, a, a lot of useful comments in the chat. Uh, Sophie mentions that one of the physical infrastructure um, investments that they've been making a lot in Vietnam is road building. Um, road building to cut the costs of getting forest product out onto the main roads and then into the market. And the way they've achieved that is by organizing um, uh, round table discussions with commune and district level government authorities who have budgets for road development. And so by talking to them about where the major blockages are, they've succeeded in getting many kilometers of roads built into different forest and farm producer organizations investing their money, which then um, reduces costs for the producers and, and, and increase their, their profits. So thanks, Sophie, for mentioning that. Um, yes, uh, there's a comment here about um, youth involvement from, from Davy. Um, it is very useful to have interventions on climate resilience by including the younger generation. This approach in Arusha, Tanzania has proven successful, having a generation that grows and understands how to combat the negative effects of climate change. I really like that idea of forest and farm producer organizations working with special youth groups um, to get them uh, uh, addressing the challenges, maybe using their familiar familiarity with mobile technology and so on as well. Anything else there, Kata? Uh, yes, there is a comment here also from Geoffrey um, mentioning the importance of um, conducting uh, climate vulnerability assessments um, prior to establishing what are the actual options. Um, yes. That's right. And thanks, Jeffrey, for, for mentioning that. Um, one of the um, 
uh, things you need to do before coming up with options is, is to, to make sure you've gone through a process of um, assess, assessing vulnerability or assessing risk. Um, the, uh, one of our partners in the Forest and Farm Facility Agricor has developed a, a toolkit, which I think has been used in Tanzania. It's called the Agricor Climate Resilience Toolkit. And it has a process for assessing um, climate vulnerability of different groups and then coming up with strategies, options for those. So this set of options is complementary to um, a vulnerability assessment, but you do need to go through a process first of looking at what challenges, risks, vulnerabilities people face before you then come up with um, options to help them be more resilient. A, a very good point, Jeffrey. thank you. Um, and any more, we've got Kanimang saying in the Gambia, we did introduce integrated forest fire management concepts where all the stakeholders in the landscape developed integrated forest fire management strategies, focusing on fire risk areas and priority areas. So that's, that's really useful to know. Um, and, I, and I think in the drier zones, it's, it's, a, it's a perpetual uh, challenge, which is, which is growing as, as uh, temperatures increase and dry seasons prolong. Um, sorry, Katra, I'm struggling to keep up. Are there any others? Yes, there, there are many actually. Um, Kanyuang has also um, perhaps in connection to our previous discussion on how to get information, um, climate information on the ground. Um, yes. He has alluded to the use of community radios to enlighten the population on climate issues. Okay, that's um, a very useful thing. Yeah, radio often has a reach in rural areas that few other things do. Um, and um, Isif was making a comment on the importance of developing data on climate resilience related to market, um, also using smartphones. Um, yeah, I, I think there's there's a world of possibility to give people advice and 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 so on on climate change and on uh, you know using mobile phones and information services and then there's a, a world of of opportunity to use this smartphone to increase your links with markets and your customers in different ways um, so thanks Isifu and then there is a comment um, from Mark um, providing information on um, a particular initiative in Ghana to improve uh, soil fertility where GovHub has partnered up um, with uh, an organization in the UK on capacity building for FPOs and the use of um, microbials for fertility with plans to train soil doctors. I like the idea of a soil doctor. Yes, uh, and, and very important it is too. Um, we, we, we mentioned a little bit yesterday in, the, in, the, uh, in some of the ecological options, um, you know, you, you can get really um, uh, very proficient at maintaining soil microbial uh, uh, interactions and rhizobium from nitrogen fixing trees and, and it's a whole world of opportunity to become an expert and it would be great if forest and farm producer organizations gradually built up their capability so it's good to hear GAFAP is, is, is qualifying its soil doctors. Um, then there is a question from Nyadja um, on the value that local climate monitors could add to our stock of knowledge to improve um, producer organizations resilience. Yes, I mean, I think this is this is really um, relevant and valuable. And um, yeah, Joe, I think one of the things that needs to happen is obviously um, weather forecasting and weather prediction systems are one thing, but how those changing patterns are actually affecting 
um, farm production, different crops, uh, different pest and disease outbreaks, um, the, the, the real impact of climate change. I mean, having a network of, of local climate monitors who could feed information um, perhaps to an apex level farmer organization who could then talk with government about, well, these are the real impacts that climate change is having. And so you need to put in more supportive policies uh, to help our farmer groups in this or this area or that area or with this particular crop. Because often governments do have research stations and forestry departments and um, agricultural extension services that work on drought resilience or, or so on. Um, so, so finding a way to monitor the real impacts of, of climate change and feed those upwards as well, I think would be, would be very valuable. Thanks for that suggestion. Right. Have we, have we uh, exhausted the, the uh, initial flurry of, of comments on, on that? I, I hope you found the, the uh, summary of the 30 options helpful. Of course, there will be other ways and other options um, that you can put in place as well. But I think it's very useful for um, us to have a checklist of things to remind us to develop not just in one small way, but that forest and farm producer organizations and their businesses need to be developing in many different ways in order to maintain resilience in the long term. And that it's an integrated step-by-step -step improvement that keeps you alive um, as, as, as climate change happens. I'm going to go back to sharing my screen now um, and we'll cover the second module for the day. Um, and this, this time we're, we've, we've covered all these 30 options. And so I guess the question then arises, well, how do we uh, find the, the money to finance some of this? And, and that's really the same question as, how do we mobilize and access finance for improving our forest and farm business? The same, they, they have the same objective. We want to flourish. We want our members to flourish and continue to flourish. And part of that is getting uh, access to finance uh, so that we can finance these options. When we looked uh, a couple of years ago now at um, the available finance for small forest and farm enterprises, um, you can see that there's sort of some, some people are financing um, the enabling environment um, and some people are responsible for financing business, asset investment. And when we looked at the, the forest and farm smallholders, that are those small dots on the left, and we looked at the large scale private sector, um, there were indeed some um, micro level, microfinance programs that were working for individual uh, farmers. And there were certainly at the large scale uh, private sector end, there were conventional banks, debt and equity investment that was happening. But there seemed to be a missing middle for investments in the kind of $1,000 to $50,000 range um, that involve putting in place vital new stores or processing equipment um, run by a group. And so, and, and there's a reason why there, there's a gap, a missing middle is that it's, it's fairly uh, predictable if you're doing microfinance, you loan a small amount of money to a farmer before the cropping season and they repay you at the end of the cropping season. They are responsible for repaying the loan. It's, it's quite high risk. So the interest rates are usually quite high, but it's a, 
it's an understandable way of, of fin financing. And similarly, where you've got a big company with a long track record of a bank account and so on, um, banks are comfortable uh, giving money to a really well-run operation with a long track record, a good management team, clear business ownership, all of those things. Um, it's much more difficult if you've got a, a messy group uh, trying to do business run by a forest and farm producer organization that maybe is not formally registered, um, that has some people in management with some ability, but they haven't received any formal qualifications. And the banks look at that sector and they think that's risky. Uh, we're not going to step into that gap. And Lady Agri um, did a, a, a study recently in um, Ghana, Zambia, and Kenya, which demonstrated the same thing. Finance banks usually have an aversion to financing uh, agricultural and forest uh, business of a certain scale. And here's an example of what you might want to, to have finance for. So the Choma Charcoal Association in Zambia, it wants to become more resilient and they've developed a kiln for processing the charcoal, which is much more efficient um, in terms of a volume of wood to volume of charcoal out. And they've developed these nice bags that show um, the sustainable uh, charcoal that they that they've developed uh, standards for sustainable charcoal that are, are, are hoping to be certified as a participatory guarantee scheme. But each of these processing drums uh, costs, you know, a significant amount of money. And so there's a constraint uh, in terms of production uh, to meet the demand of a, of, a, of a new buyer who wants to buy from the Choma Charcoal Association. So where do they get the finance to buy more of the uh, processing equipment to make more sustainable use of the forest resource and keep them resilient um, going forward? And that's the, that's the question we need to answer. So there are some general principles that I'll just lay out. Um, and and some, of the, some of you who have a lot of experience in business may find this very elementary and I apologize for that, but I think it's useful just to, to, to go through it so that everyone can be on the same page. So it's generally better to save than to borrow. When you save up to invest in something, then you're in control of the money and you don't pay any interest. So the, you have to save up a certain amount of money in the orange on the left, um, but it's within your control. If you borrow money, then you lose control. You have to put up collateral so that if you don't pay it back, somebody can come in and claim something of yours. And you also have to pay interest, the red portion of the arrow. So you have to pay more money for something when you borrow than when you save. It's also important to remember that um, in a forest and farm producer organization, um, there are all sorts of uh, needs of members for uh, finance. You, you have all sorts of events throughout the year that either require cash or savings or insurance. And so if you're running a a forest and farm producer organization and members are being asked to contribute money into the, the, uh, the business, um, they have a lot of other calls on their, on their money. Um, and so you might have to think of having some sort of savings fund so that when they need to uh, cope with a, say a funeral costs or a marriage ceremony, they can borrow money and then pay it back and, and that, that will keep them rather than uh, saying, well, we can't afford to pay our membership dues uh, this, this time because we're, we're short of cash. When you set up um, business organizations, this blue square 
and you have many different members in a farming area, um, the group business is often financially a bit leaky. Uh, so uh, somebody is controlling the finance and the products of the business, but it's not always clear which business, which products and which money belong to the business and which products and which money belong to the individual members of the business. And um, one of the first things you have to do when you're building financial capability is to make sure that that box doesn't have any leaks in it so that the money that is in the business is securely in the business and there's no risk that the business manager will be spending a little bit on the side and there's no risk that some of the trees that belong to the business will be quietly sold by members when they need cash. So the best way to improve access to finance is, as you all know, is to introduce record keeping, improving accounting, budgeting and management skills and promoting savings and, if necessary, self-help savings groups. Um, these can turn into investment funds that the business can use to buy the equipment it needs to advance to the next level. So this is uh, just emphasizing that point. This is uh, an example that Vincent took me to see in the Zambia and, and it's the Tubaleke Women's Club. Um, it's a group of women who um, came together around um, basket weaving. They identified basket weaving as a way of earning additional cash income from their subsistence and local trading farm products. Um, they also set up a village savings and loans association um, under the uh, under the under the normal rules where you have a cash box and and people uh, carefully managing those joint savings and so they were able to loan money to their members um, to begin to diversify uh, production so members started to do additional things like uh, pig rearing and and fruit production there's a, a, a biogas stove being run off um, uh, the, the animal manure. And this experience of uh, as running a savings and loan fund, it helped them when there was a drought, uh, there was a serious drought, and the group agreed that it could use the, 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 the profits from the savings and loan fund to keep people with enough food uh, to survive the drought but also the, the money in that savings and loans funds can, can be used to invest in new um, business opportunities for their members. Um, so with that experience of running savings and loans, some of the women in the Tubaleke Women's Club are now able, identified by Zanaco, the bank, um, which has mobile money booths, as being able to uh, operate and work in these uh, mobile money booths, which means that um, they get a, an agency fee for that and they can put their money into a bank should they wish to. Um, and they can also get loans from the bank should they wish to, to further their business ideas. So building up your financial um, capacity of members can lead to gradual and increasing progress and opportunity. Why, why does a business keep records? Uh, <laughs> you know, it, it's, it's, um, it, it, it's often overlooked, but you have to know whether the business is doing well or badly. Uh, you need to know what to change to make the business work better. You need to know who spent what uh, on what so that you avoid any potential scandals and conflicts. And you, can know, you need to know when future expenses will arise so that you can put money aside to anticipate um, for future expenditure. I guess I hope that you're all aware of the three main types of 
um, accounts that make up good financial management. Um, but I thought I'd just introduce them again for, for, to make sure that everybody's aware of these, because when we looked at the Lady Agri report on developing businesses that have a really um, good grasp of their finances, there were sort of questions over um, financial accounting. So it's worth investing in building up financial knowledge, uh, at least with your treasurer. So you need a balance sheet that you know who put what money into the business and where that money is now. So the money in must equal the money out. Otherwise, somebody's making the money go missing. You need a profit and loss account so that you know for a particular period in time whether the business has made a profit and loss. And you need a cash flow analysis to know when money needs to be put into the business and when it will generate a profit. Often businesses go out of business because they don't anticipate all the money they're going to need to spend before the first sales. This is a simple balance sheet, just so that you can understand what it is. So you have members of your producer organization, A, B, C, D, E. They each put some money into the business. And then there was a matching grant from an NGO called Tide. And that has a total amount of money. And the, the business group used the money $400 was spent on fertilizer, 500 on tools, some rent for the building. They paid their labor, labor a little bit. They've put some money into a bank account and a reserve fund um, for emergencies. And, and that money is equal to all the money that was put in. So you can check that nobody's misused money. Once you start to sell product, um, of course, you have income from the sales that's added in red on the left, and then you've increased the amount of money in your bank account, but you've also had to pay for transport and a market store. But still, the money that's been put into the business, 2,400, is equal to the money that's been invested, spent by the business. So that's a, a balance sheet. Profit and loss account. Uh, all of you will be aware of what a profit and loss account, but essentially you tot up your costs on the one hand and your sale of product on the other hand. And your sale of products has to be greater than your cost. One of the things that people often do is they don't include their labor as a cost. And so they do a lot of things uh, for free should try and avoid that. Secondly, people forget that tools wear out and so they don't include uh, an analysis of depre depreciation of vehicles and tools um, when they calculate their costs. So if you want to, to see this business is actually making a loss um, and the way to make it, it's spending uh, too much on, it's spending a lot on fertilizer, on rent, uh, transport, renting the market stall and labor. So it's got quite high costs and it's only selling $800 of, of, of product. Um, and so it's, it's uh, when you take 800 from 1,025, it's making a loss. How could you uh, increase it so that it's profitable? Usually uh, the- I'm easy not sure I understand. Mm, sorry. Usually the easiest way of increasing a business's profitability is to reduce the cost somehow, to share transport, to share a market stall, um, to find ways of, of reducing costs. And so in this example, uh, by sharing the market stall, finding a cheaper rent and a cheaper supply of fertilizer by using organic fertilizer instead of expensive chemical fertilizer, You've still got the same product sales, 800, but now your costs are only 725. And so you have made a profit rather than a loss. 
So you have to know how to handle a profit and loss account and your accountant should be able to do that routinely with you. Often businesses fail because they, they get money from the sale and they think that's profit. And so they spend it <laughs> um, and they don't then, they're not then able to cover the costs. So profit is, as we all know, uh, your, your sales money minus your costs. That's what you can afford to distribute or reinvest. When you're starting up um, your business, you need a special plan for your costs because when you're starting a business, you may have to pay um, some costs that you'll not pay again. You may have to buy the land or a building or build, buy a transport or a processing machinery. And the first year is always more expensive in a business than subsequent years. Um, but sometimes you have to pay labor and costs for quite a long time before you begin to harvest a crop and so on. And so um, you need to have a plan to raise money, not only to cover the startup costs, but also the running costs until the, the business makes a profit. And so it's best to raise this money from group savings where you uh, where you are in control of the money, the money is yours, rather than to borrow the money where if your business doesn't work, you then owe interest on top of the, the loan that you, you paid. So I'm just going through some um, basic elements of, of how you run finances. If you do a cash flow analysis, a cash flow analysis just looks at uh, the expenses you occur, and then the income that you get on a monthly or periodic basis. So you can see in this business, which is a beehive business in, say, Tanzania, that in order to start the business, you may have to buy some beehives and some protective clothing, some storage containers, a honey filter, some things like that in the first month. And then um, as the months go on, you also have to pay for labor and transport and some jars for your honey. Not all of these you have to pay every month. Perhaps you only have to buy jars every second month. So you'll see that in the first month, you were out of pocket by 590 uh, whatever. <laughs> I'll make up imaginary, imaginary currency. But you still haven't sold any honey in month one, so the income is zero. And in the second month, you still haven't sold any honey, but you've incurred some additional um, costs like buying the jars, going to the town to buy the jars, uh, labor costs. So you're now out of pocket by $710. Uh, and it's only in the third month that you begin to sell some honey and you've still got some more costs. So you're still out of pocket by $570 in month three. And it's only after several months of selling honey that you break even. You begin to have actual cash back in your hand, profit if you like. So when you do a cash flow analysis, this is what you're, you're predicting for the future, what your cash flow is going to be. And you can see that actually, if this business is to survive, you need to have $710 at the start of the business, not 590. Do you see what I mean? So you have to plan for future expenditure to make sure you have enough resources to cover it until you break even and begin to turn a profit. I will, I will not dwell more on the, the detail of finances. Um, merely that when we're thinking of building resilience um, and we need to finance that resilience, you have to have a basic understanding of how to account for money. And you need to have a system within your forest and farm producer organization that accounts for and controls money. 
And this is often the best place to finance what you need to finance because your farm producer organization, forest producer organization will be selling something. So it will be generating income. If you can save some of that income, that's a good source of income savings to invest in whatever you need. But in a marketplace, your, your producers and the producer organization on the left may have be selling its product to a buyer or a, tra or a trader. And often buyers or traders can help to finance what you need to finance because they, they want to receive your product. And if you say, we would like to improve our production process so that we can produce larger volumes or better quality, the buyer may be willing to put money into your business. And that, and that will enhance um, the, the money you have to invest in climate resilience options. You can get money from microfinance, you can get money from banks. Getting money from banks, as we all know, is, is really difficult in the forest farm sector. You have to have really clear information on who owns the, the business, who manages the business, exactly what you need the money for, exactly how you will repay the loan, it's quite a, 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 long, a long process to prepare a business plan that a bank will accept. Um, and then there are project finance uh, you can get from climate, uh, from development projects. And then there's sometimes national programs or, or investment programs that you can get money for. So when you're thinking about how, do, how are we going to afford to invest in these climate resilience options, don't just think we need a loan from the bank. <laughs> um, there are six different sources of finance. Um, and uh, if anybody's interested, you can get access to that book that just looks at this in a little bit more detail. So I think I want to stop there and and just um, have a, a few questions about how do we finance these climate resilience options and get some some feedback and examples from um, members in the group of how have you been financing your climate resilience work um, and I, I know that for example Kwame um, was talking about this lovely agroecological training program that they were running with their farmers. But as I understood it, Kwame, that was financed externally. Is that right? You may have, you were having internet problems, so you may not be on the call. In which case, can I ask for any questions on the whole issue of how do we generate finance um, to finance some of these resilience options? It's the money section. So the, the audience has been stunned into silence. Yes, Mark. Yes, um, Duncan, thank you. Just, just a quick contribution. Um, I think flowing from what you presented, especially from the very first slide around the fact that savings are usually the best option um, because loans come with interest. And of course, your money is essentially taken away from you, uh, from your control. I think I would go more for a blended financing um, option um, because of the fact that very often when you want to scale, um, you probably would require a certain amount of external funding to be able to get finance an option comes in where you can use your savings as a leverage in providing new opportunities to be able to contact others. It could be people they are even uh, supplying to as, as, as a business or any other related financing mechanism, either from the private sector or even government. And so I just wanted us to avert our minds to the fact that um, as you grow uh, or as you, you scale up, you may require some external 
support to be able to make the business grow. But this might not also be totally the case. If you're able to uh, manage um, successfully using savings as a business, you could even expand um, through reinvestments from the profits that are made. I just wanted to bring this uh, also on board. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Mark. And yes, that's a, it's a great set of observations. And yes, I think you all, especially if you're trying to take the jump uh, by investing in some processing technology or doing something a little bit more advanced, then you often need to blend money you've saved with external finance. I think that's absolutely right. I guess what I wanted to emphasize was that nobody external will blend their finance with yours unless you have shown your ability to save and manage money. So it, you, you won't get a loan from the bank if you don't have a bank account that shows a track record of, of good financial management. And so you're absolutely right. We need to blend savings with loans. Um, and and, and in, for many groups, they've moved into very advanced businesses where this is no problem getting access to external finance. But often there is a problem getting access to external finance. So you have to build up your, your own manage, financial management capabilities first. Um, and that's a really useful, useful point. Um, have we got any other? Uh, Elvis, please. Yeah, Duncan, um, thank you. Um, just wanted to mention uh, something quite specific um, in relation to Ghana. I thought Mark was going to talk about that angle. Um, the scenario in accessing formal uh, financing from uh, banking institutions in Ghana is quite a, a dicey situation. And so, um, you know, in Ghana, the strategy has been how do we model and improve the village savings and loans, which has been uh, one of the key uh, resilient points for FFPOs, especially uh, as it was tested in this COVID era. Mm. So Mark's organization has been piloting the upgrading, you know, two forms of upgrading. Uh, Kambaku upgraded to a microcredit uh, union, of which uh, they've been able to have very substantial savings in 2021. Uh, Mark's upgrading is looking at how to formalize this uh, village and loan scheme and linking it to the formal banking system so that its credibility and sustainability would be visible to financial institutions to be interested in partnering. So mostly the VSLA, they do annual share outs rather than uh, investments. So we're trying to model this VSLA into a three prong uh, Just slightly, but I, I I understood the 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 points you're making, and it does sound like an excellent strategy of of developing the VSLA mechanism, the joint savings, but instead of just distributing all the the uh, profits from the returned interest and loans at the end of the year is to use some of that money as an investment fund um, to, to, to kind of increase your capability to, to do, to buy things as a group. And I think that's, that's fascinating. It'll be interesting to hear of, of those examples as they're developed. Um, uh, becoming a microcredit agency. There are several, um, that we know of in Latin America where forest and farm producer organizations have effectively become credit agencies. They've, they've been generating profits by processing product for their members and they've turned that into successful businesses. And then they've used their, their fund, their, their money from those profits to act as a credit agency with their member groups. So these are, these are really exciting things to explore because the more that the farmers themselves are in control of the finance and the money, um, I think the more secure and resilient in general they will be. Um, but it's often a long road to get where you're trying to go. So, <laughs> um. 
Cool. Has anybody else got comments? Kata, are there any comments in the chat? Um, so Tang uh, echoed um, Mark's and your points about um, uh, a mix of uh, financing sources um, and informs us that in Vietnam, um, FPOs have been able to um, create and access different loans and investments for their production uh, through their own savings, but also through um, credit green fund uh, funds, banks, enterprises, and government programs. Okay. And then Kanimang um, also makes um, makes a suggestion that FPOs can sometimes raise funds through organizing fundraising events, such as hosting live bands. Sometimes yes. Fun. I'm sure in in, Gam in the Gambia, a live band would be really rocking too. <laughs> oh, hang on a sec. We'll come back to, to you, Kata, but um, I think Hosea and Vincent. Vincent, do you want to chip in there? And then Hosea. Got yeah, a hand, um, I yeah it's, it's actually, I hope my, um, you can hear me well, because we also have, have been getting some you 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 breaking and uh, hope I, I don't think it's from my side but i hope i'm clear i want just to emphasize um the importance of um, business incubation i think at the beginning uh, on day one uh, if i remember you mentioned that um, this has worked well in other sectors and business incubators uh, they pay they charge for this service but uh, of course, looking at um, the, the kind of uh, uh, clients, if I can use that term, mm. we, we are working with smallholder, uh, forest-based, rural, and uh, to think of business incubation as, um, as a financing mechanism, sometimes we may find it difficult. But I really would want to say it's an opportunity uh, for farmer-based organizations or cooperatives to their members if really we can uh, incentivize business incubation mm. we look for markets you know if uh, we know traditionally that um, the, our products are sold at this low value and uh, as a business organization we make it serious as a target that you, we can find a higher value market and uh, probably get 1% commission for getting that market will be an income generating, you know, a facility for us without really uh, making judgment that we're dealing with so much a very rural, they run away, the group members, will, but really it will be up to us, the group, to make it real in terms of looking for these opportunities. If it's finance, you know, if we're going to say, we're going to look for finance for this project to run uh, for you, you know, as a business incubator, we're going to link you up and facilitate that you access this finance. We can charge a service for that, you know, mm -hmm. without, uh, without uh, you know, uh, 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 swallowing weight. So if we manage to get so much, 2% will come for service. This is an example of one group that uh, when we're having a monitoring and learning uh, 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 workshop, there is um, a group that deals with women, uh, it supports women group. And they're really on the ground looking for financing and they charge. Once they get that money, they know it is also for their own benefit. As much as it can benefit the group or the individuals in the group, but it benefits the association, the cooperative. Mm. If you say 2% will remain for the cooperative, it will be a source of financing. Mm. Well, at it's going to save, you know, the intended purpose to the group or the individual in the group, but it also saves as a source of financing for you as well, which you can reinvest and use for other things. So to me, I think business incubation is, is, is a turning point for most of, of our, our member-based organizations to provide services that will improve and we can charge for that service. As long as the services are guaranteed, you know, and you really, you, you really need to make sure that you look for those services that will bring income to your association, to your cooperative, you know, in such a way. I really wanted to say that because I feel really it's an opportunity we have and it can generate the revenue. 
Thank you very much, Vincent. And, and yes, I think that's right. I mean, as, as an organization develops its capabilities in business incubation, <clears throat> I think you can begin to sell those services, um, sell business training services, not just to the members, but to groups outside so that you're not sort of, you, 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 can, you can maybe offer services to other clients and not just your members, which I think is really, really good. Um, did anybody else want to, to jump in? Uh, Jose. Yes, um, I, I, just, um, I just wanted to comment on um, how you can raise the, the funds for the, for the association or maybe we have one example of um, where um, they were doing applying savings. So once they, they contribute to the money, at one point, uh, the members were fearing to, to get the, the money. Uh, I think they were fearing on the, on the interest parts. So this group, they, they had accumulated a good do amount. So they sat as a group, said, no, we have the money in the box here. What should we do? You members, you are not getting the, the, the money. So they sat down, then they started a business of honey. So they, uh, they made about uh, 70 beehives. So this time they are into, into honey production and they are, they are doing quite well. Um, three days ago, they called me because normally we communicate that I find the gate for So they called the we have it for us. So um, I think village banking and savings in other areas, it's, it's working very well as a uh, um, generating of the working capital. Thank you very much. Yeah, I, I do think it's, it's a really um, useful approach and increasingly um, in some countries in Africa, you've got these sort of mobile banking options where you can, you know, put your money into a, into a sort of deposit account, although I understand that sometimes there, there are difficulties there, but um, Kata, is there anything else? Thank you, Hosea. That's really good to hear that the success with using that method for, for kickstarting honey production. There are a couple of comments, but um, uh, if we don't have time for all of them, perhaps the question by Jeffrey would be a, an interesting one to discuss. He asks, how easy or difficult is it for FFPOs or FFPO members to aggregate um, their contribution funds, like through the VSLA and later by government security bonds? It could be also a question to the whole group. Oh, that might be have to be a question to the whole group. I must, I must confess, not to being um, a financial expert by any stretch of the imagination. So I'm, I'm not myself very confident in these more um, a, a, a options like buying government security bonds are beyond me. Um, but I think it's, it's certainly the case that when FFPO members aggregate their contributions and stuff, you can invest and save those in secure ways. Um, and, and, and I think I really like the, um, the idea behind uh, um, Teleberry's um, VSLA thing where you, you've got this social fund, business fund and investment fund um, yeah, and that, that seems like a really, uh, you know, good experiment. Um, Sophie says, maybe Mark can answer this. It depends on the trust the group yeah. have in the government. <laughs> Hi, I am a bit off because of the uh, shaky internet, but I think, can you hear me? Yes, okay, we can. Great. Yes, yes. yes. 
I, I, I got off a bit because the internet was a bit shaky. Yes, I think the the point there is really something very um useful and worth exploring. And I think Sobi just alluded to the issue there. It just also depends on um people moving beyond their usual comfort zones. Because the groups, for instance, are used to the fact that they need to be able to see the money physically uh, being traded amongst themselves uh, in the group. So at the group level, it's much more easier and more cohesive. But mm -hmm. if you want to move from the group to the collective where your money has to go into a bigger pool, that's where it's taking a bit of time for people to uh, to really adapt. But of course, I think we, um, as we, we, we have observed, even with the VSLA concept, it took quite some time before populations, especially rural populations, became very confident enough to put their monies in those VSLA and boxes. So I'm sure mm -hmm. it is not um, something that is not achievable. I think working and accompanying groups in that process, I think ultimately could be one entry point. Uh, thank you. I hope you heard me. <laughs> yes, heard you very clearly, Mark. Thank you very much for, for that. Um, good. Well, uh, let's move on now then to the last um, module of the day. Uh, thank you for all staying with us. Um, and let me try and share my screen again. Um, so we've talked a little bit about uh, access to finance. And now the final session is just to uh, get us to think, how can we use our work on big business incubation and risk management and climate resilience to actually um, document spread understanding of climate resilience, but get access to climate finance itself. Um, and and we, we talked uh, on the, um, the beginning of yesterday about this model of climate resilience that uh, as as Jeffrey said we need um, to uh, do a risk assessment that predicts the hazards we might be facing looks at the vulnerability assesses the vulnerability and the exposure to climate but we also need to think of the broader risks um, that FFPOs face to the, in the market with their workforce, uh, all of those six areas of risk that I, I mentioned on days two and three. And then we need to uh, come up with responses. How are we going to be resilient in the face of climate change? And I suppose one of the, the, the first steps is to, if we're trying to attract people with climate finance, is to document what we're doing in different ways to become more climate resilient. And uh, this is an example from Vietnam that uh, the team led by Tang and Yvoan uh, had presented, a very talented uh, lady uh, uh, presented this and leads this Yen Duong cooperative in Vietnam. And it's, it's uh, a mountainous cooperative um, in, in northern Vietnam, where they're producing a whole range of um, uh, products, which include uh, vermicelli sticky uh, rice noodles and uh, sticky rice cake. And you can see the nice packed packaged products that they're beginning to, to produce. You can see the vermicelli noodles on the left at the bottom. They're producing honey. They're also growing a range of, of organic vegetables, and they've developed a participatory guarantee scheme that certifies their products as, as organic um, for the market. And many of these activities have involved uh, diversifying their production and protecting their natural resources and enriching their natural resources um, through their business activities. And so they presented their case study as an example in a, in a uh, climate change uh, conference as we were coming up to the um, climate change conference. 
because they're doing things that are relevant uh, to, to climate, surely a cooperative like this should be able to receive funding from climate finance. That's what climate finance is for. And when we looked at the 10 case studies that we did to develop the Diversification for Resilience book, um, we had case studies from Bolivia, that was the uh, Fed Prasau, Ecuador, that was Kalari, uh, Ghana was Kuapuasau. Um, I've, sorry, I've got some, uh, somebody, somebody needs to mute. Um, Kenya, Ma, uh, uh, Madagascar, Nepal, Tanzania, Togo. When you looked at all those 10 case studies and you looked at the 30 options for resilience, you can see that almost all of the forest and farm producer organizations are doing almost all of the resilience things that they could be doing. And I think this is very important because it shows that forest and farm producer organizations, here are the last se sections of, of the last of the 30 options, except for the very more expensive or technologically advanced options, most of the producer organizations are already trying to do each of these options. And that means that um, if you've got climate funding that is supposed to be for climate adaptation, um, surely you should be channeling it through forest and farm producer organizations who are doing all these things anyway. And you can see that some of these options like putting in climate adapted stock or enhancing biodiversity, they could also uh, be mitigating climate change, i.e. taking carbon out of the atmosphere in trees or, or, or better soils and so on. So these forest and farm producer organizations are not only adapting to climate change by putting in place climate resilience, they're also helping to mitigate climate change by enriching the number of trees on the land. So surely they should be the beneficiaries of climate finance. Because of that uh, reason, the Forest and Farm Facility have been trying to help connect forest and farm producer organizations to climate change finance. And uh, a professor called John Kerr worked with Jose Diaz to prepare a toolkit on connecting forest and farm producer organizations to climate finance. And it provides a brief overview of, of some of the issues um, and how, how to think about some of these issues. I've, I've concluded the link there. So when you get the presentation at the end of today, you can have a look if you're interested. And in that uh, toolkit, it says that we have to understand that climate finance is divided essentially into money to stop climate change, mitigation, and in forest context, that means planting more trees, storing more carbon in the, in the forest and in the soil. And so there's um, various programs that are nationally developed uh, to do that. And the ones we might know about are the uh, Red Plus programs where there's strategies for reducing emissions from deforestation and degradation. The other thing, the other pot of money for climate finance is to help people adapt to climate change that is already happening. And uh, for these, there are national adaptation programs, nada national adaptation plans, there are adaptation funds. And uh, yeah, there's, there's a green climate fund internationally and many bilateral sources of money for adaptation. So we've heard how climate resilience, building climate resilience among forest and farm producer organizations is both helping to adapt to climate change, 
and it's helping to mitigate climate change. So it should be possible for us to get involved. And more recently, there's been a lot of talk about um, cross-cutting approaches that do both adaptation and mitigation, and they're often called forest landscape restoration. And there, are, there is an international um, commitment under the Bond challenge to restore degraded land, make it more resilient, effectively, uh, 350 million hectares by 2030. And in Africa, uh, there's the African Forest Landscape Restoration Initiative, AFR 100, um, which is trying to restore land. So forest and farm producer organizations should be part of AFR 100 because you are the people who control the landscape and you're the ones who can plant trees and increase soil fertility and become more climate resilient. I guess if, if you want to tap into climate finance, you have to know what the options are. And this is a map, if you like, of both the multilateral climate funds along the top and the bilateral climate money. So money from particular countries. It's too complicated for me to explain. But what I can say is that there, there are different funds in green and that there are different institutions um, who, are, who are either in blue on the top or in white on the bottom. And when you look at which institutions are controlling climate funds, then they're, they're institutions like the World Bank, UNDP, UNEP, FAO, IFAD. If you look down the bottom, you've got DFID, GIZ, uh, NORAD, USAID. So in your country, if you want to learn about climate finance, the best people to speak to are probably those institutions because <laughs> they control most of the international climate finance. Um, so I'm sure some of you will already know of some of those institutions in your country. And, and I guess the best way for a, an FFPO to be involved in uh, climate finance is to offer to implement climate adaptation or mitigation, which you're already doing anyway, okay? I guess if you were to be part of a project um, that was trying to um, improve climate resilience, you would have to understand how to go through a formal climate risk assessment. Um, and uh, uh, we, we already mentioned that you, there are methodologies for doing climate risk assessment. Um, and I've, I've given you a link to one of the guidebooks. Uh, it's, it's very much like a risk assessment that we did in days two and three. So if you do a regular risk assessment for your business, some of your risks will be climate risks, but you might need to see a detailed methodology. And then you need to understand, of course, what climate resilience is. And um, we've, we've got various, there's an Agricor set of case studies and we've written that book. You can get hold of understanding climate resilience effectively so you can speak the language <laughs> of the climate financiers. Um, and you might want, if you want to get access to climate finance, need to work on your data, collecting information about your FFPO and what you do. So if you're an Apex FFPO, how many members, how many member organizations uh, do you have in your, in your group? how many individual members and households are in those FFPOs, how much area of land do those uh, FFPOs control, and how much of the area which you control are you trying to do restoration, either adaptation or mitigation? How much carbon would be stored if you did that? 
So an FFPO to get access to climate finance has to think, right, we need to understand what the climate money is and which institutions control it. And then we need to become an implementing partner in a climate project. So we need to be able to offer something. And this is where you can offer to put in place climate adaptation for this number of people in this much area, and that will perhaps have a benefit of this much carbon. So a good way of advertising yourself uh, as, as able to do climate work is to develop stories to illustrate past success stories. Um, and we've been trying to help some of the forest and farm producer organizations to, to show how they are becoming more climate resilient, how they are helping with climate adaptation and how they are doing climate change mitigation. And we need to, to tell stories about how our forest and farm producer organizations are at the front line of solving the climate problem. I don't know who else is going to plant the trees in the rural areas if it isn't the farmers. There's nobody else out there. So we need to tell these stories as effectively as we can. And, and you can see the Agricor um, uh, pr publication, which did case studies of how different forest and farm producer organizations were, were contributing to climate change. These stories are often really compelling and, and it still frustrates me that when you an analyze how much climate finance is getting to the local level, only 1.7% of international climate finance reaches the local level. Everything else is siphoned off in big international agencies, government departments, consultancy fees, da 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 da. Only 1.7% is getting down to groups like this. So this is the National Farmer Group Federation in Nepal, and they've been helping their members adapt to climate change um, in ways that involve um, using organic uh, fertilizers to increase soil fertility, rainwater harvesting and rainwater ponds um, to, to make sure they've got irrigation water, using solar panels rather than uh, regular diesel generated electricity to pump the irrigation systems. You can see that they've developed greenhouses to grow drip irrigated um, vegetable plants. They've got a, a, a market information and weather forecasting system developed on the mobile phone. Um, they've developed diverse home gardens which rotate crops to avoid pests and diseases. They've developed a participatory guarantee scheme um, to certify their products as organic using the local Nepalese language and so on and so on. This national farmer group, like many farmer organizations, is adapting to climate change and helping to mitigate climate change by storing soil in trees and, and soils. So they should be able to get access to climate finance. Um, and it's a great frustration to many of us that very little climate finance is reaching them. Practically, what can you do? Well, you identify in-country government and NGO agencies and that are handling the climate finance. You look at what the national climate plans, these national adaptation plans, these national mitigation plans, and then you try and set up a discussion on how does what you're doing help to achieve those national plans, making a concrete offer based on how many people you're going to help and how many, how much area of forest or how much carbon you're going to restore. And that's really the best advice 
that I can offer. And it's often at the level of an apex uh, forest and farm producer organization that those discussions can be most powerfully done because you'll know some of the people in the right places. Um, oh, and that uh, takes me to the, to the end of um, what I wanted to say on trying to access climate finance. Um, I guess what, what my main recommendation for you is if you are interested um, in uh, looking further at that, do refer to this uh, toolkit, which is available on the internet under the FAO um, website. Um, but it, with that, I'm just going to stop uh, the sharing for, for a moment to allow any questions on, and, and really to get your opinions and observations about how can we do a better job um, of accessing climate finance for FFPOs to support FFPOs climate resilience. Does anybody have any uh, success stories in their country of where you've managed to link a forest and farm producer organization into a red program or a climate adaptation program? I, I think there are some good examples now in, in, um, in, in the new GEF uh, projects where hopefully farmer organizations in places like Zambia are going to get some access into the climate finance. Is that right? Yes, <clears throat> actually, yeah, I can I can confirm. Even in the project documents, we uh, we have the FFPOs uh, placed in them. Uh, actually, we had a bit of a discussion yesterday. Although they say we should open up uh, just for transparency, but uh, we know. Uh, organizations like the Pitaki DFA, uh, they have a higher chance, especially with this background you're providing, you know, if they can demonstrate fully that uh, we are doing these and with that kind of information, then uh, they are already, because they're already in the product. And yes. uh, it's just now to, to demonstrate that we can, we can do it. So we have this one and uh, even other pipeline project like the GCF, We've also placed uh, ZMFC with a chapter to lead. So it's really now to demonstrate capacity through these kind of uh, examples we are providing. Uh, uh, yeah, thank you very much. Thanks, Vincent. Yeah, so that's the example of, of the FFPOs, specific FFPOs have been written into a, a, a big project that's coming in from the Global Environmental Facility it's, it's being um, managed through FAO, one of the organizations that I mentioned have access to some of these bigger funds, are, are accredited implementing agencies for these bigger funds. So working together with your colleagues in FFO, FAO UNDP, the World Bank, um, and, and so on, is, is a really good way of trying to get built into climate uh, money for climate adaptation and, and climate mitigation. Anybody else who can give examples of um, how to how they've managed to get a, a forest and farm producer organization? Um, yes, we have a Jeffrey. Do you want Jeffrey? Do you just want to mention the Tanzania example to give my voice a break? <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you, Duncan. Yeah. Uh, yeah, actually, I'm just uh, adding up as one of the example. Uh, Njumita has indicated on the chat board is one of the APEX FFPO in Tanzania. So after the support from the FIP program, uh, while it's reducing the early code, uh, climate resilience tool, uh, of course, the number of FFPO are part of this uh, support. And Njumita actually also happened to be much more, I might say, designated uh, to run the, the study and as well as to design the project. So the FAO country, obviously, and Tanzania, 
uh, decided to collaborate with Mjumita to carry on the process. So it's one of the examples with regard to the Apex FFPO uh, to access the climate finance. Thank you so Thank much, you. Jeffrey. Um, so that's a, another example of where a link to uh, an agency here, FAO, has helped to get uh, Jumita linked to the Green Climate Fund. I know from experience that writing these proposals for these big funds is well beyond <laughs> what is possible for most forest and farm producer organizations. But if you enter into partnership with some of these um, big international agencies, UN agencies, they can write you into these proposals, um, which is really um, the way I think we'd need to, to prioritize this. Uh, Isifo, you, you asked to share some experience from Togo. Okay, thank you, Duncan. Thank you uh, for your presentation. Hello to everybody. Hello. Just to maybe share the experience uh, uh, currently with uh, FFPO in two. We, F we, we work with uh, one of uh, FFPO Fetier based in Region Central uh, called Mapto. And uh, regarding the call for proposal of the initiative you mentioned in your presentation. It is a FR100 initiative. Uh, the, so the, you know, they the launched the call for proposal. And we, uh, as uh, FFF, as FAO, FAO we work with uh, this uh, FFPO to propose and other, and other, other FFPOs and propose uh, some activities related, uh, regarding this initiative. And we are pleased to inform you that uh, we get the first uh, partner, the MAPTO has been selected in the top 20 uh, uh, FFPOs or organization who, are, who will be financed by this initiative. And uh, I think uh, we, we, are, uh, we are expecting the, the other FFPO maybe would will be selected. But what is important to, to mention is that we work closely with the FFPO to prepare their, uh, their proposal with the support of uh, uh, FFF ash uh, so this is uh, one example to, to let you know that there is opportunities on climate, cli climate finance, but the challenge is how to prepare, how to access by FFPOs. So it needs uh, the capacity building and the collaboration with uh, different agencies of uh, UN and especially FAO and uh, uh, other agencies uh, who are, who, which are working on climate uh, issues. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Isifu. That's really helpful and good to hear a, an example of that AFR 100 um, program that um, is, is, is a sort of exciting many people in, in different parts um, to do with forest landscape uh, restoration. Um, so I think uh, Teleberi from Ghana is also on standby for the AF100 on the next batch. Um, so different forest and farm producer organizations, as you develop your, your institutional organizational capability and your ability to tell stories and document what you're doing, um, it really could open up opportunities for receiving climate finance. Again, it's quite a complicated uh, sort of end point, but we can see several FFPOs reaching the level of maturity where they're trusted partners, implementing partners in climate finance programs. And I, I, um, I hope to see more of that in the years ahead. Are there any other last comments? Uh, Kanimang, please do come in. Yes, uh, Duncan. Thank you very much, Anna. I'm trying to.
technology seems to be muting you. I'm sorry, Kanimang, we're struggling. Can you can you hear us now? Yes, I'm trying. Uh, yes, I'm, I can I can hear you now. Great. Uh, I want to I want to give my own experience from the Gambia with uh, the project called uh, Ecosystem Based Adaptation Project. This is one of the projects funded by GCF in Africa, and uh, the project actually is uh, building on uh, what FFF started in the Gambia through supporting the uh, forest uh, management groups. Uh, currently, uh, they are working with 60 uh, forest areas managed by over uh, 80 communities. And each of those communities do access funding from, uh, from the project, especially in terms of fire management. Uh, they are given uh, at least uh, uh, some token to ensure that uh, forest fire management is effective in their own community forest areas. They get access to these funds uh, through uh, development of an effective forest fire management plan. And uh, the number of factors they, they, they are able to protect at the end of the year, uh, they're giving a thousand balances, which is uh, equivalent to uh, not more than uh, 20 US dollars per hectare. And this is really very motivating. Uh, we have succeeded in protecting a lot of forest areas based on this initiative. They are also supporting forest uh, producer organizations through protection of natural regenerations. Uh, certain three species are identified within forest areas where they declare at least peripheries of those, uh, uh, they have very good seeds uh, under those uh, mother trees. So they are given at least uh, some financial compensation to protect those uh, uh, natural regenerations uh, uh, in forest areas, especially focusing on uh, important tree species like Terecapos, Caia Senegales, and others. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Kenny Mang. Really interesting to hear that. And, and so, yeah, some of these activities that might be of benefit in any case for, for farming business, forest and farm business, protecting fires, and so on can also be funded through um, climate adaptation and, and mitigation programs um, as part of these um, ecosystem restoration uh, projects. So I think, um, I hope uh, that has tied us, uh, brought us to, to, a, to a happy conclusion. Um, so we started on the first day um, with the idea that business incubation, supporting one another um, in solidarity. Uh, <laughs> uh, business incubation uh, should be something that forest and farm producer organizations can carry out as they develop their business know-how. And we then said that a central part of business incubation was to do a risk assessment process with your forest and farm producer organization so that you're looking at the challenges ahead and thinking what support do I need from the incubator or what other support from outside do I need? And then uh, coming up with a management plan to, to improve the business based on that risk assessment and, and management. And then we looked in more detail at some of the options for uh, uh, becoming more climate resilient and indeed for becoming more resilient as a whole, not just to climate, but also to other uh, shocks and stresses. Um, and, and today we finish by saying, can we find ways of uh, financing all of that very useful work, um, perhaps by linking into to climate finance, because climate resilience involves both uh, adapting to and mitigating climate change. And so it should be something we can sell to people who want to do climate finance projects. I hope that is, has been a, a logical flow. Um, and of course, we would very much like to hear whether you found this training course useful it's a very compressed um, time. We haven't been able to meet face-to-face -face or do practical group work 
face to face. We haven't had any field visits, um, but we would be grateful if you would um, fill in a, a, an assessment of what you thought of this training course and please be as honest as you can. Um, and uh, so, oops, uh, I have to go down. I think uh, we've, we've got an evaluation sheet um, and what we would like you to do is to say whether you think we hiss the, hit the bullseye or whether we missed the target. Um, and you can answer four questions with three is a bullseye and zero is missed the target. Was it interesting? So uh, if you found the course interesting, perhaps for some of you, it was things you already knew. So I'd be interested to know, was it interesting? Will it be useful? Did, did you think there were things in the course that you will actually use that will change what you do? Did the format work, um, the virtual format, the homework each day, um, the, 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 the sort of question sessions between different modules? And finally, was it easy to understand? Uh, did I do a good enough job of explaining any difficult concepts? Um, so we, we're going to try and incentivize you um, to uh, provide a, 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 a a response sheet by saying you will only get your certificate for attending, <laughs> which Ali has prepared. If if you send us, if you fill in and send us an evaluation. So if you if you send us an evaluation, we will send you a, 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 a certificate. Um, and your homework is really for the year ahead. Uh, if your forest and farm producer organization has the right level, is of the right scale, think about setting up a business incubation unit um, that helps other local businesses manage their risk. Help a one, at least one business to do a risk assessment, including climate risks, so that they can think of having some actions for the year ahead to improve their business. And please use the 30 options as a checklist to think through what are some other ways we could do to make our business a little bit more climate proof. So I hope you've got a whole year to do that homework. I hope that's, <laughs> that's sufficient. And it just remains for me to, to say, please do the evaluation uh, for us. And, uh, and it's been a great joy to spend these last five days with you all. Um, so Ali, do you just want to explain what you'll do with the, um, the evaluation form and so on? Yeah, of course, I'll, I'll send it uh, by email. I've put a link to the form also in the chat just now. Um, <clears throat> so if you could just email me your completed form back and confirm the, the full name that you'd like on your certificate and then I will respond with your certificate. Um, so hopefully that works for everybody. And if you have any issues, you can always uh, put questions and things in the, in the WhatsApp group, which will stay active and then um, I can get back to you there as well. Yes. So it, it remains to me to formally close this training event, uh, thanking you all for, for coming and I wish you every success uh, in the, in the year ahead. Thanks everybody.